we're closing out a series today that we've taught every week this month titled Compassion That Never Changes. And one of the first verses we've been looking at has been found in Exodus 15, 26, where the last half of the verse God said to the Israelites, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Literally, I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, your healer. And so he says here in the New King James, I have, which I have brought on the Egyptians, he says, I'll not bring them on you. And so we read verses like this, and it brings confusion when you come into a church like Odessa Christian Faith Center, and your pastor stands behind his pulpit by the grace of God and teaches you that God does not harm people, that God is not your enemy, that God does not destroy people's lives that God does not bring depression and fear into people's lives, that God does not make people sick. And yet when you read the Bible and you see verses like that and other verses we're going to see today, it kind of brings confusion. And when a Christian is confused, it genders doubt and unbelief in their minds. And God wants us to be rid of doubt and unbelief so that we can receive from God every good and perfect gift that has come down from our Heavenly Father. So if you are taking notes today, the name of that sermon, Does God Make People Sick? Okay, you're ready for some truth here? Some more truth that will set you free today? You ready? Exodus 12, talking about the Passover. Verse 12. God says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. This makes God out to be like a cruel God, killing babies, killing little kids. It makes us think he's cruel, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute or I have decided judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. So the Israelites were instructed as a type of the cross to take the blood of an animal, smear it on the lintel and the doorpost. And that when the angel came and saw that blood, he would pass over. Therefore, we get the word Passover. He says, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the plague of death shall not be on you to destroy you. When I, when I strike the land of Egypt, it says, verse 23, buckle your seatbelt. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer. And not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Who is doing the striking? The destroyer. What did Jesus say in John 10, 10? The thief comes to steal, kill. The Bible makes it out that God's the one that does all these things. The translators have written it that way. Not the original Hebrew, old, and not the Greek, the New Testament. Translators wrote it this way. God makes it clear. I will not allow, allow is a key word here, the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And so God here is just making a decision. He's passing judgment that allows the destroyer to destroy. In Revelation chapter nine and verse 11, John the Revelator writes about Abaddon, in the Hebrew, and Napoleon in the Greek. Those are the two names of Satan, and both names in the Hebrew and Greek mean the destroyer. God is not the destroyer. What happens is, when God's enemies continue to pursue the things that they pursue that are against God's will, eventually, God lifts his protection. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that God reigns on the just and the unjust. That's his goodness. The goodness of God is even on sinners today, church. It's everywhere. 
But when it becomes so egregious, there comes a time God lifts his protection. Come on, somebody. God is good. God is light. The Bible says, in God there is no darkness. Jesus said about the devil, when he comes to find me, he will find no darkness in me. Jesus is the perfect representation of God our Father, and he is light. In Jesus, in the Father, in the Holy Spirit, there is no darkness. It's the devil, the destroyer, that the moment protection is lifted, he's always at hand to destroy He's not doing God's bidding. Don't think that. Don't infer that. He's always ready to destroy. He's all because he watches us, church. And any time we stay in ongoing known sin and we stay stubborn and disobedient, that protection gets lifted. So is there a difference between permitting and committing? There is. God doesn't commit it. He permits it. Jesus said the same thing. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth, whatever you forbid on the earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you permit will be permitted. If you permit, once you hear the gospel, to say yes to Jesus, you're permitted the new birth. If you hear the, the teaching on healing and you receive it, believe it, you're permitted to be healed. Come on, somebody. But if you reject healing teaching, you won't be bothered with it. Whatever you permit is going to be permitted by God. Whatever you forbid is going to be forbidden by God. Church, we have to wake up and, and hear the truth. Because when you know the truth, you can be set free. So personally doing something isn't the same as allowing something to be done. God just allows it. Look at Judges 2.14. You learning something? Y'all are quiet today. It's great. I love it. You know I'm not moved by your quietness. You know that, don't you? I'm not. Judges 2.14. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. Who did it? The plunderers. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around. Their what? Their enemies. So that they could no longer stand before their enemies. See, God is not allowing this to happen because his children of the Israelites obeyed him. It's not because they obeyed him. It's not because they pleased him. It's not because they were doing what he told them to do. Listen, church, if you read the Old Testament in context, they're always in this situation of a being allowed, God allowing the enemy to destroy them because of their disobedience, That's right. their idol worship. That's right. They're burning babies. That's right. They burn their babies to the God Moloch. They would throw them into this oven of fire. They disobeyed the prophets whom God sent to teach them to repent. They refused to obey God. And so we see it all throughout the Bible. If sin eventually will not be repented of, the destroyer comes to destroy. Nehemiah chapter 9, 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient. Now this will begin to give more light here. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and they rebelled against you. This is the Israelites. They cast your law behind their backs. They killed God, your prophets. You testified against them to turn them to yourself, to get them to repent. And they worked great provocations. God, they continued to provoke you. Verse 27. Therefore you deliver them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them. It's the enemy who oppressed them, not God. And in time of their trouble, now I want you to, I want you to hear this. In the time of their trouble, when this is after all this disobedience, all this stubbornness, all this arrogance, all this pride, all this sinfulness. When they cried to you, to you in their trouble, you heard from heaven. You did what? You heard from heaven. And according to your abundant mercies, to your what? Not your judgment, to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. 
God's just looking for repentance. He's looking for truth. Verse 28. But look at this. But after they had rest, or free from their enemies, now then the economy starts to go right and we forget God. Hmm? The church prayed for you to get a job and now you're making money, now you forget God. God heals you in the church and now you quit coming because you got what you wanted. You got rest from your enemies. They again did evil before you. Therefore, you left them in the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned, here we go, and they cried out to you, you heard from heaven and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. Church, this happened repeatedly. But every time they came to God and repented, God in his mercy healed them and delivered them from their enemies. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. This can happen to a nation, to a city, to a church, to a family, to an individual. Psalm 78, 61. And God delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hands. Okay, listen. God is just passing judgment that allows the destroyer to destroy. However, as I've been showing you, and I'm going to give you another verse in just a moment. This is not God's will. It's not God's will that we stubbornly refuse his love and his advances towards us. It's not God's will that we get into sin. It's not God's will that we get in to the kinds of things the world's getting into today. It's not God's will that we live our lives not pleasing him. Listen, you can Google this. That's where I found it. Every single day, 365 days a year. This year, 366 days a year. 150,000 people die on this planet of about 8.2 billion people. And unfortunately, many of those people who die way before they thought they were going to die, they go into a Christless eternity. Is that God's will? No. Second Peter 3, 9, it's not God's will that any person Black, brown, white, yellow, red, old, young, male, female. That they pass from this earth and go into hell. That's not God's will. I've shown you several times over the last several years, several verses from Ezekiel that says it grieves God's heart when that happens. Remember that? It grieves his heart. Huh? None of this stuff pleases God when we stubbornly refuse his love and his mercy and his advances of goodness towards us. Many things happen today that don't please God. There are many things today that are not God's will. There are many people, church, today that are dying against his will. And so we have this sovereignty mentality, the sovereignty teaching, which is one of the most egregious teachings in the church today on this planet. Well, if they died at 35, it must have been God's will. Well, if they got sick with cancer and died, it must have been God's will. That sovereignty teaching. No, it grieves God for those things to happen. It grieves God when his children come down with some kind of a terminal disease and they end up dying. The good thing is they get to go to heaven. But they left before their time. And so quit accusing God when the pillars of the church get sick and die young. Quit accusing God. Well, pastor, they, they come to church all the time. That's a work. Coming to church is a good thing. But when you make it a work, when you say it in that vein, that's a work. Well, pastor, they, they were always serving in the church. That's a good thing. But now you've made it into a work. You're basing God's will on what they did. Why do many Christians, now, you don't know the hearts of people. You don't know what's going on with people. Don't act like you do, because you don't. I don't. But quite frankly, Christians get 
distracted. They quit pursuing the things of God after so many years. They get bored with it. There's all kinds of reasons. But the number one reason is Christians are not receiving, as I said earlier today. You've got to learn to believe and receive. You've got, and it's, an, it's a daily, you've got, I get last week's t CD. You've got every day, every day, there's a devil every day. There's a destroyer every day. And there's consequences to our unbelief and doubt. There's consequences. God doesn't cause these things to happen to you. I don't care if you've been the best Christian on the planet. If you don't receive and believe, things are gonna happen. They're evil in your life. That's why you have to become circumspect. You have to wake up, as the Bible says over and over, wake up unto righteousness. You gotta wake up to it. Because God loves you. And God has given you a pastor in this church to tell you the truth. So that you will wake up. Not in a obligating way. Not, you're not obligated to do anything. God doesn't obligate you and I don't. But you need to know the truth. Okay? God, God grieves when his son and daughters die at 40. He, he grieves over it. But it's not his fault. Because he has spoken to us by his word. Lamentations. Well, and so, again, now I'll close this, this part. I'm about to close here in just a moment. Let me close this part. Because when these things happen, sovereignty teaching teaches people, and they say it all the time on ministry shows, everywhere, people are saying, God's in control. Let me ask you a question. Did you eat what you wanted to eat this morning for breakfast, or did God tell you what to eat this morning? Did you put on your own clothes or did God tell you what to put on? Did you bathe this morning because God told you to or because you decided to? You see how ridiculous some of this stuff is? Because they're saying God's in total control. And what it is, it's just, it's just a, uh, a means where people, they want to put it off on God. That we don't want to take responsibility. Lamentations 3, 32 and 33. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict or allow affliction willingly. Did you see that? Willingly. Nor grieve the children of men. I'm telling you, it bothers God. Listen, I'm, I'm going to make a statement that might kind of straighten up your day. God is like you and me. He's like us. So how do you know that? Because in Genesis 1, God made us like him. Adam sinned and we fell, but once you hear the gospel and you say yes to Jesus and you're born again, you're like him all over again in your born again spirit. God's like us. We're like him in the realm of the spirit. Okay, are you ready? You ready? One more. That's going to really set you free. Uh, let me show you more insight into the heart of God. I'm trying to show you how God really thinks. Hosea 11 and verse 8. This is God speaking. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zebrim? Zeb, Zeb, I don't know how to pronounce that. These are two places that have already been destroyed because of judgment, because of disobedience. Listen to this last part. This is what God says. My heart churns within me, within me. My sympathy is stirred. God's not happy when we live in sin. It grieves him. And what grieves him as much as anything else is the consequences of what living in sin for the Christian is. Disobeying God, rebelling against God, living the world's way. It grieves him. His heart is churned within him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the New Testament, there was a man living, cohabitating with his father's wife, his stepmother, living in fornication. And Paul addresses it. You know, you don't understand today how, how far the church of Jesus Christ in America has fallen beneath the standards that God has set forth. We just kind of accept everybody and allow anything. Paul didn't. 
So in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, he says, deliver such a one to Satan, this man living in sin with his stepmother for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The Amplified says, you're to deliver this man over to Satan for physical discipline, to destroy carnal lust, which prompted him to incest. Passion, translation, release this man over to Satan for the destruction of his rebellious flesh. Again, folks, today, it's not the, the problem is not sin. That's not this problem. The problem is that there is not repentance from ongoing continual sin. People keep doing the same things over and over and over. If God is the one who strikes and destroys, then Paul was wrong to say that. He was wrong to say that if God's doing all the striking and all the things. So let me ask you a question. Do we have a part in all this? We do. It's just to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and live life unto the Lord. Live your life with faith unto the Lord, Paul said in Romans 14. Do you have faith, he said? You as an individual have it unto the Lord individually. And I close with this thought. There is a, a thought in the worldwide body of Christ, especially in America, that I call no-fault religion. That when they're in sin, they blame you. Back in the late 80s, when we had two major ministries get into adultery and fall, many people gave up on God. Many people gave up on the, on the church because they called them hypocrites, which they are. But not every Christian, not every pastor, not every minister is a hypocrite. There are many people who go to McDonald's who are hypocrites, but you still go. But many people gave up the Lord Jesus Christ. They're always blaming somebody else for their life. When God confronts us lovingly, mercifully, he's always trying to send people to us to tell us the truth, to get us into church so you can hear the truth. But many people reject that. And God grieves over that because we don't take responsibility. We don't take accountability. But you can do that. You know, we were in El Paso a few weeks ago for Abundant Churches, an annual Abundant Conference. And uh, his name's not coming to me. Uh, the guy does the Latin praise and worship, Marco Sweat. We're gonna have him, we had him a few years ago, we're gonna have him again. But he got on it, talking to his Latino friends. Woo, did he get strong. He said, you know, in our culture, we have a tendency to uh, show up late everywhere. Well, he addressed that. He addressed it and addressed it very frankly, but lovingly. We have to learn to live life circumspectly, to be accountable, because we don't want to be accountable to anybody. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. It's just in our fleshly nature. We don't want that. But God says, I want it for you. I want you to learn to be responsive, to be accountable to me and to the people I put in authority over your life. And when you do, you know what's gonna happen? Your life will be lived fully. You'll have peace, you'll have joy, you'll live in righteousness. You'll live in the healing and the health and the wholeness of God. Why? Because you're doing what Jesus said. You're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and all, all means all, all these things will be added unto you. If you can receive it, would you give him praise today? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there's no doubt about it, based on what we heard today, that God is not the destroyer. Jesus said, John 10:10, 10, 10, it's the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So God does not make people sick. God does not punish people. God does not hurt people. He does not destroy people. That's all the work of the enemy. I trust that you've learned so much today that you'll be able to put the devil to flight. The Bible says, submit yourself 
and therefore to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So I want to thank you for joining with me on The Voice of Faith today. I remind you, God loves you. We love you. Till we see you next time, God's blessings be yours. On DonKWood.com, check out the latest season of Pastor Don and Mary's video podcast called Faith Builders. They dive deep into topics such as walking in the spirit, love, and strength. But there's something we need to grow in, that we're submitted one to another, in that we serve one another, we minister one to another, we do one for another. And as the marriage grows and gets stronger, that will even get stronger. These brand new episodes are freely available to stream on donkaywood.com. Visit ocfc.store, our online streaming platform where you can access a vast library of Pastor Don's teachings anytime, anyplace, for only $10 per month. Start your seven-day free trial today. Bring everyone that you know to church on Palm Sunday, March 17th, and on the most meaningful day of the year, Resurrection Sunday, March 31st, to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Voice of Faith is shot and produced at Odessa Christian Faith Center, a church where we are always building great lives. We are located at 9000 Andrews Highway in Odessa, Texas. Join us for our Sunday worship services at 9 a.m., 1045 a.m., and 1230 p.m. Or you can watch them live at ocfc.online.church. We also worship together on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Find out more about us at ocfc.org. 